60 minutes, we will discuss what is likely to change in American foreign policy toward uh, Europe's eastern neighborhood after Joe Biden's, uh, Joe Biden's elections for president. And also what are the new opportunities and priority areas for cooperation between Washington and the EU capitals as they deal with growing number of crises and challenges in this region, plus assertive Russia and Turkey enforcing their own rules. Just to clarify, under Eastern Neighborhood region, I mean Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, plus the three Caucasus countries, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. The current trends in the region are not encouraging. We will discuss uh, more about them in a moment. But without further ado, uh, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce you our distinguished speakers. Dan Hamilton, director of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Global Europe Program in Washington, DC. Hello, Dan. Hello, everyone. Uh, Christina Gerasimov, my colleague and research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations, where she leads our work on the uh, EU's uh, Eastern um, Partnership Policy and on the whole region. Uh, hi, Christina. Hey. And Stefan Meister, uh, head of Tbilisi's office of uh, Tbilisi office of the German Heinrich Böll Foundation, and also an associate fellow fellow of German Council of Foreign Relations. Hello, Stefan. I have to say good evening. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in this first part, uh, we will have a chat um, among ourselves, uh, me and speakers, and um, then I will open up conversation to your questions or reactions after some 30 minutes. And you will find technical information how to ask your questions in the chat. Then let me start with you. So what is the talk in town in Washington after Joe Biden's uh, election for president? Uh, or is there any discussion or rumors about um, his foreign policy team? Who would be his people um, in the uh, National Security Council or State Department uh, responsible for Russia and Eastern, um, and Eastern neighborhood or anything else you can share with us? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's important probably just to understand that still the context of the U.S. election process. Uh, so Joe Biden, Kamala Harris are the presumptive president-elect, vice president-elect. They have the electoral college votes as reported by the media. Uh, but the U.S. states don't report those results until early December formally. So there is still a process underway, uh, you know, the, according to the rule of law, uh, to uh, get this done. And then the electoral college uh, voters, you know, those people are the ones who elect formally. And that doesn't happen also until December. There will be some recounts in some US states. I don't think any of that will change. I don't think this process will change the outcome. But one needs to understand it'll take still some time before one can speculate in it with any seriousness about what will be coming up. Um, the, President Trump is contesting some of the results, but uh, and Republicans are siding with him. But I don't think anyone really believes that will have much impact. But one needs to understand, I think, it's uh, seen from you know outside the United States that this U.S. transition process always takes quite a long time. Even a transition from a friendly administration to another one takes a while. We switch out the top three to four thousand people in the US government, uh, the top for three to 4,000 people. And many of them have to be approved by the US Senate. And so they have to appear in testimony, they have to have a hearing, all of that, they have to have security checks. It takes a long time. I don't anticipate a next administration fully in place until sometimes toward the middle of next year. So uh, speculating about names right now, these are probably all names you probably know, but no one really knows. And I think, you know, frankly, uh, it'll be an uncertain transition for a time. I think the question is, what will Europe do? I think Europe will make two mistakes. Uh, first is right now, I can already see the commentary. Everyone breathes a sigh of relief and says, oh, thank God. Now we can go back to business as usual. I think that's a mistake. We're not going to go back to something that has really uh, doesn't exist anymore, the old type of relationship we have had. Uh, and that has implications for Eastern Europe. The second mistake, sorry. 
Bill. Second mistake. Well, the point is that Europe should come and prepare now. What are they offering to the U.S. new administration using the two months of transition instead of waiting around? But I fear they'll wait around. The second yeah. mistake will be that the U.S. is going to have to deal with what I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, which are our domestic problems. We have the pandemic. We've never gotten out of the first wave. It's the worst ever right now today and is getting worse again. We have the economic recession that is uh, ongoing. We have a social reckoning in the United States that is uh, due to systemic racism and accumulated injustices that it was really what propelled Joe Biden to the presidency. People just fed up with that and ready to, and expecting a lot. And then we have four years of Donald Trump legacy. Mm -hmm. Those are big challenges. And I think the impression in Europe will be the Americans are going to be isolationist. I think that's wrong. You simply have to understand the U.S. is going to have to turn to its domestic issues first because if we can't help ourselves, we can't help anybody else. And, These are important uh, reminders. That doesn't uh, mean turning away. It just means understanding this will be a transition time that takes a while. Thank you for uh, bringing this in. Um, let's come back, however, to uh, still relatively fresh uh, news of uh, the election and the fact that the next president of the United States is Joe Biden. There were some interesting reactions throughout the region, including in Russia. And um, let me bring in you, Stefan, um, if you can share some, some of the most extraordinary or interesting ones. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this, um, this discussion also, um, even if it's maybe a bit early to really assess uh, what, what, it, what it really means. Um, so if I'm looking to the Eastern Partnership countries, and I'm looking uh, particularly uh, at the moment to the South Caucasus, um, I think there is a somehow a positive reaction, but there is also a lot of realism um, about um, the US and, and what the US can provide in, in, in future. Um, and um, uh, look, for instance, Georgia um, is a, is always a key, was always a key partner yeah, of, of the US in, in the past years. Um, uh, and there were no really huge changes from Obama to um, to Trump. Uh, there was uh, there was already this kind of disengagement and less attention um, on the region uh, under both. But for instance, under Trump, um, uh, Georgia got weapons uh, uh, supply which they did not get um, under Obama, uh, and there was also a kind of continuity, at least in in the in the yeah in this field of um, uh, uh, weapons um, co cooperation. Um, I think for, for the countries here in the region, especially Turkey, uh, especially Azerbaijan and Georgia, Turkey is the key NATO partner, uh, also in terms of, of security cooperation. Now, let's discuss later maybe the Karabakh conflict. Um, uh, yeah, but, but I think uh, Turkey is here the, 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 the key partner. And I think everybody understands that, um, uh, that uh, US policy in the region is about Russia. Um, yeah, so it's about supporting those countries um, uh, in the region also against uh, Rus Russian influence um, in, in, in the region. And um, I think uh, the main partners in the US, for instance, for Georgia, were always the Republicans. Um, uh, yeah, and also in, in, in the Congress where, from whom they got um, most of the support. And I think they will look mostly, and I think this is also with other Eastern Partnership countries, the case um, on, the, on the future Russia policy um, of, of this administration. And I think what we can expect maybe might be more engagement on arms control and maybe also, and I think this is a, what also Georgia, Georgians, for instance, expect a tougher approach uh, on, on Russia. Um, uh, yeah, and maybe more attention also on Russia. But um, I'm, and I think many here also rather skeptical if this also means um, really more engagement, for instance, in a region like, uh, like the South, South Caucasus. Um, sure, Christina, thank you. Sorry, Pompeo Stephen. is coming this, this month also to, to Georgia. Uh, I just want to mention this uh, to, to maybe to also to show that there is US support, maybe also as a reaction of Russia's role in the Karabakh conflict. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I think that's, that should be also mentioned, and this is a big issue here. Um, but um, yeah, I think the countries are really realistic in terms of um, this disengagement, what we saw in, in, the, in the last years from the US side. Christina, um, when moving on to Ukraine, 
Moldova, Belarus, to this part of, of, of the neighborhood. What were the reactions to Biden's uh, election? And also, what do you see in terms of US engagement, disengagement? What are the expectations there? Um, thank you, Milan. Um, I think in general, if, you know, while the US elections have dominated cover pages and prime time on most media outlets in EU member states, I think the Biden-Harris win is not really prime news for the region. And this is mostly because all three countries you asked me to refer to have serious domestic uh, tensions currently unfolding with possibly very long term consequences. So out of the three, I would say yes, Ukraine is the one that kind of had most coverage of the US election, uh, not least due to the fact that Ukraine itself was under the spotlight in, 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 uh, in the US campaign. But still the US election coincides with a mega constitutional crisis in Ukraine unfolding at the moment post-local elections, anxiety with the ruling servant of the people party in terms, you know, uh, how modestly they have won in these local elections. And last but not the least, you know, the fragmentation of president's control over his own party. So yes, President Zelensky congratulated Biden on winning the election. He hopes for further cooperation. He, you know, hopes for a, a better future strategic partnership with the US. Uh, um, um, but out of the three countries, Ukraine, let's say, is more or less of an exception. And now I'll go briefly to Moldova and to Belarus. Uh, Moldova um, is, is an interesting case because the US election uh, came two days after the first round of uh, very heated and critical presidential elections in Moldova and it's you know in there are basically a few days before the second round on November 15. Uh, so a scenario of early parliamentary elections here also cannot be discarded. A lot of political instability in the country amidst a very, very bad pandemic situation. So it's fair to say that the coverage and reactions to Biden were really minimal. Um, while Europe was celebrating Biden's uh, win, uh, President Dodon was busy swearing in four new ministers and deputy prime minister. Mm -hmm. In Belarus, uh, the elections also coincide with with still unfolding post-election crisis. Uh, what we saw last weekend, uh, Belarusians witnessed one of the most serious weekend protest arrests with over a thousand uh, people detained, uh, um, beaten and tortured by the regime. Um, Lukashenko reacted, of course, to, uh, to, to, the, to the election, characterizing it as a parody of democracy. And he said that he wouldn't expect any change with, uh, with Washington, regardless of the outcome. Uh, Tikhanovska congratulated Biden, expressed uh, hope to meet him soon in a new and free Belarus. Uh, she very much emphasized as well Biden's uh, repeated, in a way, foreign position in support of, of the Belarusian people. Thank you. Um, Dan, let me get back to you. Um, so you warned us at the beginning that um, this will be at least half a year transition and bumpy transition before the new Biden-Harris uh, administration is fully in place and can conduct uh, foreign policy. Uh, you also warned us that this will be a domestically, or reminded us that this will be a domestically focused presidency with a, with a full table. Um, let me quote you, however, some things will change in, in foreign policy towards Russia, towards Eastern neighborhood. And let me quote from your recent article where you, where you said that US was very unpredictable actor for Europeans when looking East. Uh, that it was more of a source of anxiety uh, than reassurance, that it was selectively engaged, more spoiler than <laughs> stakeholder. Now, presumably this outlook will change. So what can we realistically expect from a Biden administration to supply for Europe? Yes, you remind us Europe is in charge. It's Europe's neighborhood. They should not, it would be a mistake to, to expect that everything comes back and um, there will be US leadership and European capitals can hide behind it. But still, presumably this outlook will change. So what can Biden administration bring to the table and what can we expect and the countries in the region? Right. Well, let me say again, this is my personal view. I'm not representing anybody except me. <laughs> I mean, I think one can anticipate a few things. 
first of all, that quote you took was, I think, the trend that one had seen, uh, and I agree with Stefan that actually under both uh, President Obama and President Trump, the U.S. had had turned from becoming what I recalled in that article, a European power, comprehensively engaged, to a power in Europe, one that's selectively engaged, not as attuned. And uh, that tension is still there in the United States. It really comes down to the question, do you think Europe is stable or fragile? And I think uh, the Trump Republicans, if you will, and progressive Democrats, so on the far right and the far left, basically think Europe is a stable place. And the Europeans, uh, the Trump folks think they, you know, if they want our protection, they should pay for it. Uh, and otherwise it's not really needed. Whereas the progressive Democrats think the EU, for instance, Western Europe should take over and do all of this stuff. And why should the US be so engaged when we have so many other things to take care of? It's a confidence in Europe that I think many Europeans are surprised by, but it also implies that the US would be less engaged. I think the centrist Republicans and Democrats, which is frankly more Joe Biden, uh, believe Europe is not all that stable, if you think of the entire European continent, especially the spaces that we're talking about today. And that the US has to return to be a source of reassurance, not anxiety. I mean, at his person, Joe Biden is the most transatlanticist president since Bill Clinton. I mean, he feels it in his bones. Uh, he has been to this region many times. He knows all the actors. He is engaged fundamentally in ways that other presidents simply haven't been. Now, what? so his instinct is to be re-engaged and to do what he can. I think now what the administration does, given all the other issues, will be more the question. If you break it down, I think on Ukraine, Ukraine will be an important, um, you know, a partner for the United States. I think there'll be a real, you'll see a real re-engagement uh, of, of the next administration on Ukraine, uh, somehow rejoining or joining some type of format so it can be involved in the negotiations. The Normandy format doesn't allow that. I would suggest maybe a consideration is to join the Normandy format with the Budapest Memorandum signatories. Those countries that signed the Budapest Memorandum uh, could join with the Normandy partners and maybe there's a new frame there that allows the US to uh, participate. I think you'll see also the important thing to understand in this region, as Stefan noted, is the role of Republicans and frankly, the role of the US Congress. One has to keep in mind, I think often the US Congress has been the driver on some issues important to this region. And back to our uncertainty, it's unclear who will have the majority in the Senate uh, until another runoff election to, to in Georgia, our Georgia, the state of Georgia, uh, to, that won't be known until January. So we won't even know who's in charge uh, of a really important part of the Congress till then. But I think the instinct will be to support Ukraine, but to be very tough. It's what I you know, usually say, it's tough love. Uh, we're with you, but you have to create the conditions by which you can come closer to the West. There'll be a very fo big focus on anti-corruption. Uh, it's not just you know, support for Ukraine with weapons and things. It'll be a, you know, a broader strategy. On Belarus, I would suggest the key here is not to make Belarus a NATO issue. Uh, that is a trap. That is not, that is what Lukashenko and Putin want. And I think the US, I think they understand to avoid making that any NATO issue. It's not about NATO. It's about the people of Belarus and fraudulent elections and how they respond to that. I think you'll see Before the US want to join with the EU. And, I, and, I, and if you want to go on, let me just sum it up by say, the other track here will be, you'll see a real turn to the US to establish a truly strategic partnership with the European Union. That has been sort of the weakest read in the relationship for years and years and years. And so the US can join the EU on a whole range of issues, letting the EU in fact lead on some areas like much of this region, but being there, being a source of reassurance. Uh, and that includes sanctions, for instance, on individuals perhaps, uh, when we come back to Belarus, more than what we're seeing uh, now.
Very good. Uh, before we come to uh, the war between Azerbaijan and Armenia, um, and let me bring in Christina just to react very briefly on what Dan has said towards Ukraine and Belarus. Well, I mean, I cannot uh, say more than to agree that it is not too early in a way to say that Ukraine is identified as a priority country among uh, all in the region. Uh, Biden recently published a statement on Ukraine in which he promised to, you know, help push an end uh, uh, to an end the conflict in Donbas. He promised to support reforms, maintain the military aid, uh, back the rule of law, and so on. So no real surprises here in, in his statement. Um, I think what's uh, you know important also is to look at Biden's activity in Ukraine between 2014 and 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 2016 uh, in particular. Uh, what we know is that Biden started you know starting with 2014 became really closely acquainted uh, with the politics in the country. One of um, essentially entrusted him with the operational uh, leadership on the Ukrainian direction. And uh, if we judge by his previous statements, uh, according to Biden, the main security risk for Ukraine is not Russia, but it is corruption. And the main approach of Biden 2014, you know, whatever the assistance of the US and the West, the fate of the Ukraine is, the, is in the hands of the Ukrainians themselves. So there is little doubt that the implementation of reforms in Ukraine will become the main indicator from which the US will come out and building relations with, with the country. Uh, and we also know that this is exactly what Ukraine in a way is a bit lagging behind, you know, fight against corruption and rule of law. Uh, on Belarus, Sorry. maybe I'll stop here. Very, oh, <laughs> yeah. Just one sentence. Well, I think one sentence is, though I would not expect a much engaged US here, equally to what we see with the EU side, you know, the mayor signaling that the new administration acknowledges the human rights violations, acknowledges the extent of aggression taking place is already a big support for the struggle of the Belarusians and it's a big importance for the protesters. Stefan, from where you are sitting, the one conflict that needs US re-engagement is not Donbas, but uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And after this surprising uh, uh, peace deal, which was enforced, brokered and enforced by Russia, uh, in the context of Turkey's role behind Azerbaijan, and the fact that, as you said, countries uh, in the region are looking, Armenia is looking to Russia as its uh, key security partner and protector. It was played in this deal. Whereas Azerbaijan and also Georgia is looking at Turkey as, as, a, as a key partner. The US is missing and the, frankly, the international formats are missing, um, starting with the Minsk group of the OSCE, where the three leading partners are US, Russia and France. And Russia enforced this deal without US and without France, Europe doesn't have a table uh, doesn't have a place in the table. Germany doesn't have a place in the table. It's only France, but it's a fact that um, that happened. And what are what what can a more active U.S. approach and um, Biden administration change with the results of this in half a year? No, well, I think what. I think there is a there is an overall other trend I just want to mention. I, I think we, we have a kind of a disintegration of the post-Soviet space, and we have reshuffling also of some of the of the conflict zones in the region. And this is also a reaction to US withdrawal from some re, from some region. Yeah, also what happens in the Middle East, I think, has an impact um, also on, on, on this region. Um, and I think uh, I, I don't want to say that uh, Azerbaijan and, uh, and, and Georgia is only looking to Turkey, but Turkey is here on the ground and is militarily also on the ground, is doing training, um, maybe in the context of NATO and partly, but not, not only, yeah, uh, and, and, and has a security cooperation. And for, for these countries, um, it's, it's also always important who can balance Russia um, in, in the region, yeah? And I think it was, it was less and less the US uh, in, in, the, in the last years who, who did this, uh, but it, it were other players. And I think we can really see here in the South Caucasus, this is a very interesting example, how other players like Turkey, like Iran, um, are, are coming into the region and, and also challenging Russia yeah, in its, in its um, uh, direct neighborhood. Um, I'm just, 
I don't know. I think uh, Georgia will stay a priority, like like Ukraine is also a priority. And we can also say um, there were still a lot of money for democratization and corruption uh, also among uh, through the last um, uh, administration. Yeah. So if you talk to NED people and and others, um, uh, the Congress really um, uh, did here a good job. Yeah. In in in, in some ways. Um, there might be a better understanding also of, of foreign policy issues. There might be also an, another wording. Um, yeah, and, and maybe really also by the administration, a, a, a different priority, for, for instance, in terms of corruption. And we all know how important this is, how, how these countries listen also yeah, to, for instance, what the US ambassador, ambassador is, is, is saying or what the Congress or US president is saying. Um, yeah, but um, I, I still, my, my impression is still, uh, this this process is going on or reshuffling conflicts, regional powers are coming in, and I just don't see this US engagement um, in, in these regions um, uh, that that this, I think it will have an impact, but that this will stop this process. And I also don't see the US in the, in the Karabakh uh, conflict. Um, yeah, I think Russia really created here reality with its so-called peacekeepers uh, now in, in this conflict with this corridor through Armenia, um, which, which guarantees this is also about the sovereignty of Armenia, which is undermined. Um, yeah, and, and also somehow Turkey now uh, has, has shown to other post-Soviet countries, it can challenge Russia. Um, yeah, and, and nobody controls from the NATO side or from the US side, Turkey. Um, yeah, it's just doing what it wants to do. Um, and I think this is this is yeah this is another issue which is very much discussed here in the region. Turkey is really a, as a NATO member a player which is playing its own game yeah and it is not stopped or coordinated or uh, yeah or criticized by other NATO members. Um, and I think all this creates a lot of how to say it insecurity instability um, uh, and um, and I just don't see that this new administration will really make you a, a major change of it. Before we open up for questions from um, the audience, um, let's have one round about Europe. The role of Europe is missing, not only in our discussion, but also in action on the ground. Um, what can Europe supply to this uh, regional security or lack of security? And what would uh, it need from from Washington to um, be able to uh, be more active player on the ground there, starting with the caucuses, Stefan. Maybe I just start with with one another issue. If I'm looking to, to Armenia, which uh, had a which had a velvet revolution, uh, which had a process of democratization in the last two years. Uh, and, and a strengthening of civil society, uh, also in, in the government, uh, in the parliament. Um, this is a big failure of Europe. There is a deep loss of trust into Europe uh, from, the, from the Armenian civil society, democratic forces, because there was no support at all from, from, from the European side. And this is also uh, questioning the role of, of, of this democratization movement and of this democratic government uh, through inaction, through disengagement. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know how, how to overcome this. Yeah, and, and I think also other, other countries in the region observe this kind of uh, lip services we can see from the European side. You get some funding uh, in the context of Eastern partnership, um, but the major issue, which is security for all these countries is not tackled um, from, from, the, from, the, from the EU side. Yeah, and I think um, that's, that means also you need other partners to balance Russia. Yeah, um, and uh, it seems to be less and less Europe. So if Europe or the European Union wants to be really relevant here, it needs to engage in the security field. It, it, it means also cyber security. It means um, soft, soft security issues, but it also needs uh, hard security, it needs the will also maybe for peacekeeping uh, in, in conflicts. And I just don't see this. Yeah, so we can, we can discuss a lot of what Europe should do. Um, and maybe in coordination, in a better coordination, this is what I expect from the Biden um, uh, uh, um, uh, presidency, yeah? a better co coordination with Europe, a different, co um, a different um, uh, wording also, but also, as Dan also rightly mentioned it, yeah, I think also expectations that we have to fulfill here also our part. Yeah, um, I don't see that Europe is prepared for it. 
Uh, and this is very much seen here in the region. Christina? Um, I agree, but at the same time, you know, while no one expects really breakthroughs from the Biden administration, this puts a lot of pressure on the EU to be more proactive uh, regarding its eastern neighborhood. And I think here, you know, the next challenge that everyone talks for the EU is uh, to become more geopolitical, not only in its narrative as it's doing so far, but also in policy making that meets the need for, for a more assertive behavior for the EU. So this could start, I would say, with you know, areas where there is significant overlap with US interests in the region. And one of these areas is, of course, the support for good governance uh, that both the US and the Europeans are interested in. So support for rule of law, support for anti-corruption reforms, help with you know, fighting vested interests and state capture by private business and interests. I think this is in the mutual interest of both the EU and, and the US. It's clear that the oligarchs are a threat you know, to these countries uh, uh, and the EU and US could also work together when it comes to, I don't know, asset freezes abroad on unexplained wealth, imposing visa bans for travel abroad when situation requires that to, to be done. So strengthening good governance institutions that are currently under attack across the board where they, they function is something that the two could work uh, together. Uh, here, something that so Steph... Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, let me, uh, I see the time. So uh, let me bring sure. it down before we open up. How does it sound to you? Well, uh, I think it's important not to uh, leave this without, again, putting some of the context of how the US will think about this region, I think. I didn't mention Russia yet, and I should do that. So um, I think the US will look at this region, not in a Russia-centric way, but it will consider Russia and it will also consider another power we haven't even talked about, which is China. Uh, US, if, if Pompeo is going to Georgia, you can bet that's what he's gonna talk about. Uh, but I think it's a broader consensus in the US that we have to uh, you know, have a transatlantic way of dealing with China, also in this region. So those will be two important things. Pre Mr. Biden has said that you know he needs to we need to punish Russia when it violates international law and does the things like it's been doing in Georgia and Ukraine. It needs to be held to account, uh, and he is much tougher on that. And I think you will see that. Uh, but you will see also, as Stefan mentioned, efforts probably to uh, on New Start on other arms control things, efforts to prevent accidents, mis miscalculation not as a favor to Russia, but simply it's in our own interest to do those things. And I think you'll see some of that. And I think you'll see a very uh, determined uh, rhetoric about no spheres of influence. So uh, all of that will provide a context for this. Then when you come back to what the US would do with uh, the European Union, you know, I just have to always say, as I do, you know, these countries are European. It's not a question of what Europe does with them as some third entity, they are European. The EU is not Europe. That's and to consider this region as a something else is already a problem. Uh, just in the rhetoric the EU uses, especially the, considering itself to have claim to be Europe. Europe is a very vast space, and the eastern regions of it are turbulent. And it seems to me the U.S. and the EU need to re come back on a partnership, as they have in the past, in which we understand what is it we can do together for this region. We had in the earlier years, the track of integration, that that was somehow the path by which these countries, if they got on it, would provide roadmaps and guideposts and you know the high bars that they would have to meet. I think we've seen that the idea that these countries would join the mainstream NATO, EU, anytime in this generation is not realistic. We should admit that. We should not, we should keep the door open. The open door is a very important principle, but we should focus on immediate needs of the people. Uh, and that is much more important than some abstract thing. And that's been the problem of the Eastern Partnership, if I could say, that it got the cart of integration ahead of the horse of the kinds of practical reforms that we're talking about. Joe Biden has said, corruption is a national security issue. He will make it a global, priority. It won't be just this region, but you can bet it will deal with it. And in Thank terms you. of China and Russia, if I could just finish, yeah, it's please. also about the standards by which 
uh, countries will engage those countries. China is engaged all across the region, but the standards by which it's doing infrastructure and all those things are very low. It fuels the corruption that is prevalent in the region. And last point would be to try to revive the OSCE. All of your points about the region reflect that the OSCE is in crisis. It's stuck. It's not playing the role it could. This is the 30th anniversary of the Charter of Paris this month, which was the, you know, the arrangement that ended the Cold War. Uh, and what has become of that? So I think trying to go back to the OSCE as a mechanism that we could use uh, would, would be important, but I don't see much political emphasis in Europe to do that. And also to revive OSCE, uh, there's not much Europe can do if the US and Russia are not talking. But I will resist um, to react uh, and ask questions on more of your um, relevant points that you brought and rather open it to others. Uh, please uh, switch on your cameras, preferably ask your questions uh, through a video chat. I know that uh, I can see that there are also um, more and more uh, questions in the chat. I will read them out, but first, if, um, if somebody is ready to ask via video, you can raise your hand through um, Zoom function. Okay, let me bring Mr. Soami. Yeah, thank you, can you hear me? Yes, can you introduce yourself? Um, okay, my name is Rajesh Swami and I did not want to say this, but I'm from India, so I'm a neutral observer. Uh, I work in a think tank in India, in the National Maritime Foundation. And I did not want to poke my nose into this inter-Atlantic affairs. So what's uh, your question? Yeah, I will get to that. Earlier in the day, there was news um, that the uh, US is proposing new sanctions on Nord Stream 2. And uh, considering the fact that Trump is still going to be president for another 70 days, is it entirely wise of the East European states, including Germany, to be so ent enthusiastic about Biden uh, right now? Because Trump is going to be president for another 70 days, he could cause a lot of damage. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very specific question about Nord Stream sanctions. Shall we take more questions or, or address this one quickly, briefly? Can I just say just the context? The, the sanctions is legislation passed in the Congress. Uh, so it is bipartisan legislation. It's not from any particular administration. So it's likely that a Biden administration will enter office with those sanctions in place and will have to respect the rule of law. So one should anticipate that this will continue to be a problem. Uh, it's a bigger issue than which administration is in office. Uh, I can see though, if I could suggest personally, I could see the US working with Germany and the EU to have a different type of arrangement if we all think what our common interest is energy security in Europe. And if we lift that bar and think about the pieces that we could put together to make to help that, I think one can deal with the Nord Stream issue. But it won't be easy, and uh, there is law in the United States that the administration will have to respect. Milan, you are on mute. Sorry, I, I, I cut and void. Is next. Karsten Voigt, sorry. Karsten, can you unmute yourself? Yes. I have one question concerning the remark of Dan that uh, we do not respect the spheres of influence, uh, how they are defined by Russia. That sounds nice, but the opposite is true. We have now in all southern, in all neighbors states from Russia, in the south and in the west, with the exception of Belarus, we have now Russian soldiers being deployed, which is a very interesting process of the Armenian Nagorno Karabakh conflict. That you, now the two last, Armenia and Azerbaijan, you also have now their Russian troops that deployed, which means that the Russians will demand a veto right. In Ukraine, they don't get it. They will demand a veto right on everything relating to what they call security issues. And my big problem is how can we prevent the Russians to practically establish a zone where they have a special sphere of influence where they decide about the rules, 
we can speak against it. But what are our measures, which are our measures that we can block such a behavior? Thank you. I see Gustav, you raised your hand. Is your question related to, to the same point as Karst, that Karsten raised? You have to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, no, I have uh, something in my eye. That's why I grab my, my hat all the time. I'm interestingly listen to your um, conversation, but if you put me on spot, on, yes, I did on spot, uh, <laughs> and want to, to have my, my thoughts. Uh, well, I'd, I'd be interested in how, how far is, uh, is, or will Washington be interested in becoming a mediator in all the limmering inner European conflicts, which the absence of that, uh, unfortunately, was painfully visible during the Trump, Trump years. Uh, and part of that basically made a lot of things in Eastern Europe and in the Eastern Partnership impossible because you had no European consensus on that. And if the, if the United States don't wait in with those European states uh, and reinforce the voice that want to have something uh, done with regard uh, to, uh, to the Eastern Partnership, basically it doesn't even happen in Europe. Uh, one example, for example, the tacit support from Obama for the Normandy format, although the US wasn't part of it, they supported all implementary steps and they consulted very closely with the Germans and the French at the time on what needs to be done, what next meeting needs to be up. Uh, that, that was upheld by McMaster to a certain point and then it basically faded out. And since the same time, we have a fading out of the effectiveness of the whole N4 show. Um, uh, and if you if you have some sort of speculation on how in vogue it is still in Washington to to enter this sphere of micromanagement in European affairs. Stefan, can you start with these two questions? I think the second question was really to Dan. Um, uh, I'm not so sure about uh, US micromanaging uh, European affairs. Um, maybe on Carsten Vogt's question, I think this is this is I think this is really a key, key question also about uh, uh, the sovereignty of uh, of uh, the, the states in the east in the eastern neighborhood. And I I would um, I would first of all argue that um, Russia has no option anymore except uh, this military option and uh, using these conflicts to to keep these countries under control. Yeah, and it's uh, we will see what it means for Belarus. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, Russia is also somehow losing uh, uh, societies and, and, and these countries, um, and it's, it's using this option. And um, I think um, it's, it's quite effective uh, because, I don't know, I think we, it's very difficult for, for, because I think we are not, so we could also provide peacekeeping there, yeah? Uh, but I think there are, no, there are several options which are no options for us, yeah, in, in, in these uh, conflict zones. Um, yeah, we do a lot of peace work uh, uh, around the conflicts, mediation, uh, supporting civil society, and so on. But Russia is, is just doing this is like a coup. Yeah, what they did uh, in, in in Karabakh. So they really stepping in and 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 then um, uh, staying there for five years or maybe ten years. We will see. So um, I I just I don't know. I just don't. See, I have no answer to it. To be honest, yeah. I think that's uh, uh, that because I think it's it is it, we are not willing to pay a certain kind of price, neither in terms of integration, nor in terms of military option, um, nor in terms of peacekeeping. So um, we have very limited instruments, also with regard to these conflicts and, and countries uh, and limited offers, yeah? Um, uh, so, and, and, and Russia is just doing these kind of things. So, and, and that's why I, I, I don't know at the moment uh, um, how to prevent, yeah? And, and if, even if the countries give up, certain kind of zones. It does not mean um, that Russia will not do the next step, yeah, uh, to, to keep them under control. Um, so I, I don't know if Ukraine is, has a solution, yeah, with maybe giving up the Donbass. I'm, I'm rather skeptical. Dan? Could you uh, yes. Uh, greetings to Karsten. It's good to see you, Karsten. Um, 
I mean, I think uh, you are describing the reality as it has come to be, but that doesn't mean that you give up on the principle because doing that is also uh, contributes to the problem. I think the challenge, Russia is there, it's creating facts on the ground, uh, and that's one problem. But there are other problems that hold this region back, and we've talked about them. Uh, one is that, you know, many elites in those governments, uh, you know, plunder their own governments because they are, they are still legacy systems throughout the region that have not turned the corner on serious reforms. So the, the governments themselves are weak, fragile, they're open to exploitation or to be, or to kleptocratic, you know, engagement. And a focus on that is hard work. It's not work for, you know, that changes things tomorrow. But it is critically important to get the region in a position to, uh, you know, have a different future. I think that's related to the corruption issue, which we talked about, and I think you will see a major U.S. effort on that uh, everywhere globally, not just not just in the in that uh, region. Um, on on uh, Ukraine, I mentioned. I don't. I mean, it's nice to hear the history, but frankly, uh, that's not going to be the future. Uh, the U.S. I th again, back my basic point: this administration, in my personal view, is going to be the most robust transatlantic administration you will have seen since Bill Clinton. Uh, it will, it will, it, by instinct, embrace a more robust U.S. engagement throughout the continent in very different ways. It's not going to try to dominate, and if that is what you imply by that, it's trying to create a new partnership with the EU. That'll be priority top priority. It'll try to create a new strategic concept for NATO that positions the alliance for the future and not the past. And a foundational to that strategic concept will be about values uh, because many of the allies have stepped away from the values, including the United States. And if we cannot be a shared alliance of values, much of what the rest of it is won't be, won't worth, be worth much. That'll be contentious. It'll raise an issue with Turkey for instance, exactly. and somebody mentioned Turkey. Uh, trend, I think yes. it's real issues between this administration and Turkey. Uh, it'll not be a chummy relationship, uh, and that'll be part of it. Uh, but it will, it's not limited to Turkey, uh, if you think about the countries I'm talking about. But I think you will see that uh, the U.S. will want to be engaged on Ukraine in a more robust way than you have seen uh, since the Russian intervention. Uh, and the, finding the right format for that will be one key to the puzzle, but also the other things we can do in terms of with the government, anti-corruption, all the other things I mentioned about support for civil society, those will become high priorities. They'll all be better done if we do it with the EU than if we're on two separate tracks. You're on mute, mute Milan. Christina, um, very short reaction, if I can ask, please. Um, also very briefly on Karsten Voigt's question on uh, Russia's sphere of influence and how do we deal with its veto uh, power and security issues. I mean, if we look at what Russia is doing in the region, it's obviously not taking seriously the sovereignty or the actorness of the neighbors around it. And uh, um, this is a very realistic approach. Since the US uh, started disengaging on the region, we see a more uh, visible uh, security gap there. So no one is raising the stakes, no one's raising the costs for Russia doing for what it's doing in a region which it considers its own sphere of influence. So I think we should not uh, be surprised, uh, you know, from a, a, an even less engaged uh, um, US in, 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 in the neighborhood to see a different reaction from, uh, from Russia. So again, uh, unless the Europeans, uh, the, here I refer to the EU, uh, together with the US are ready to raise the costs of Russia's behavior in the neighborhood, um, we are in no position to, to challenge this veto that it's uh, putting out there. There are several questions in the chat related to North Karabakh um, conflict and uh, this deal that Russia enforced. One is uh, about Armenia and how could Pashinyan be so confident? How, how is, why the Armenians underestimated the, the, the Russians uh, 
uh, military support and their role. Uh, this is addressed to you, uh, Stefan, as well as how can you accuse Russia of a coup when they will have peacekeepers there? What was the second question? I did not understand it completely. What, how to? The Russian soldiers now deployed are the force monitoring and peacekeepers. So how can you accuse Russia of a coup? That's a question from Gerhard Mangold. Ah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, no, I think the coup, the coup is to, to say it, yeah, uh, in, 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 uh, also with uh, question marks. Uh, the coup is uh, that uh, everybody was arguing uh, that Russia is losing at the moment in this conflict, that Turkey is really coming into the region, that it has changed the rules of the game. Um, and I think Russia has waited uh, until this very specific moment, uh, close to the to the um, uh, the victory of Azer uh, of Azerbaijan over Ar 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 Armenia, uh, to step in to negotiate this ceasefire. And um, and I think the way now how Russia is using this war, uh, on one hand to keep Turkey out, to to keep the West out, uh, OSCE Minskoma does not play any role anymore. Um, uh, and I don't think it will really come back in a serious way. Um, and to deploy troops, uh, Russian troops on the ground um, in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and be the key, um, the key um, security provider for, for Armenia. So, and have both countries somehow uh, under control. For me, this is a kind of a coup, yeah, to, to say it maybe a little bit, um, yeah, to, 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 um, to argue a little bit stronger. So I, I think it's, it's a very smart, approach yeah um, it's also a very cynic approach yeah but um uh, i think um in the end russia russia is now still staying the key the key player there and it it, it uh, we see a limited uh, sovereignty of armenia even even less uh, sovereignty and um also with this nahi Chavan corridor um i think it's highly problematic for um for um uh, for 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 armenia uh, uh, it's also a victory for turkey but uh, it's russia who will will provide uh, this uh, security also for 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 the corridor um so in the first question how how um uh, armenia underestimated um maybe also uh, the russian support um i I don't know if they really underestimated. I think the, the, the Armenians are somehow realistic. Also, uh, they they don't they also don't trust Russia, yeah. But they don't have any other choice. So this is only Russia, which is a security pro provider uh, and guarantees with its troops on the territory of Armenia uh, somehow its its security. Um, and uh, that's why it's part of ODKB, yeah, to to to, to also to 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 get this this kind of support. I think what the, the Armenians really underestimated that that um, this this the, 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 the rules of the game are changing so fast. I think they underestimated also the military um, uh, dominance of of um, of Azerbaijan and. Um, uh, and I think it's also a failure, uh, not only of Pashinyan, but also of other Armenian governments in the last years, that they did not invest in, in their um, uh, modernization also of the army, army to, to have a response to this. I think they could have seen this. And um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, don't trust the Russians, especially if you have a, pre a prime minister who is democratically uh, uh, elected and is coming to power um, via street protests, yeah? Um, so, um, yeah, so in this sense, I think there's no other choice for, for Armenia than to, to, to count on, on Russia because no one else will, will provide some kind of security for the country. We have three minutes left. Uh, Dan, as a closing statement, if I may start with you, uh, you mentioned a mistake that Europeans could be doing in the next uh, half a year as uh, the new Biden administration will be settling in. If you were sitting in German Federal Foreign Office or in the European Commission, what would you do now towards Washington? And um, when you looked at the statements by High Commands, Foreign Minister or Germany or uh, Ursula von der Leyen towards Washington, what were you missing perhaps from their side? Well, as I said, it's not for me to say what Europe should do. I seem, seem to be how to use the time best. It's not about Germany just coming on its own to Washington, but what's it doing with its European partners to consider re how we reinvent the transatlantic relationship. It's far beyond this region, frankly, but you know, how do we do this? It's not back to business as usual. So we have to step forward. There will be a tremendous pressure on Europe 
to do more, not less, with this new administration. I'm not sure that's sunk in. The expectations will be greater, not lower. Uh, and in a range of areas, including this region, what is the EU prepared to do with this region? Why do, why do one look first to the United States? Why isn't one looking to what the EU should do together with the United States? And what's the EU suggestions for that? That's the kind of thing I think one could would usefully use these two months to get together. I don't see any evidence that it's happening. That's my that's my concern. Christina, uh, you are next. And if you could mention also civil society, as there was there were questions in the chat about what could US and EU do for civil society in Moldova after USAID cut its support. And Moldova is your country of origin. Well, I think it's really still quite early to, you know, speculate what it's what's going to happen with the with the next uh, administration i think it's very important to you know wait for for the key positions in a way to to be announced and then uh, we will we will see um, in a way the um, you know what would be the what will be the the let's say the new approach towards Moldova. But generally, it's a low key country for for the U.S. Uh, if it could absorb, if Moldova could absorb all the in a way support that it gets from its international partners, it would already achieve way more than it uh, does uh, right now. I think the you know the the advantage. Uh, that um, that we saw previously before uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, took uh, on in 2016, one of the major advantages of, of the US assistance was that it was very well coordinated between the US Embassy, between the National Security Council, the State Department, the Defense Department. We saw this very clearly on the case of Ukraine, uh, but also in Kishino and in Tbilisi. So here again, it, uh, I think it's important to uh, wait and see who becomes the new Secretary of State, new Security Sector Advisor, who will oversee these countries' uh, direction in the White House, and then we'll be able to, to uh, operate with more than just speculations. And over to you, Stefan, what would you like to see from Washington in the coming weeks and months? And you have one minute. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe the vice president <laughs> would be nice to, to get, but I think really they will deal first of all with domestic issues, yeah. So I think this is now the, the task for the next year. So I, uh, the next month, I would even, I would say, yeah. So maybe, maybe you get, um, State Secretary of State or something like this, yeah. But I, I just want to make uh, one more, one more additional point. I think what what uh, Dan mentioned several times is this fighting corruption and building up institutions, which is the key challenge um, in in all these countries. And I think this is something the EU uh, is it could be strong or could be stronger, yeah, if it it really would build up this kind of leverage or this kind of. But I also think uh, if you talk about Russia. Um, if we would really more seri seriously cooperate with Russia on fighting, uh, with, with, with the US on fighting Russian corruption, we could also build up leverage on Russia uh, with regard maybe to, to, to some of these Eastern partnership countries. So, and I think it's, it should be really, and this is really what the main point Dan mentioned, we are not prepared for this Biden, um, uh, uh, for this Biden government. I think this is our problem. We are waiting for something, but we need to prepare for it. And I think this is for me one of the key areas where we could cooperate and would make a difference and really impact also Russian policy in Europe uh, and also in the, in the Eastern Partnership countries. Thank you. Time is up. Uh, Dan, Stefan and Christina, thanks so much for your thoughts. Uh, thank you to everybody for sharing your time and uh, See you uh, in, on during uh, some of our next online discussions. Have a good day, stay safe and healthy.